Thank you very much, uh, Ray, for that overly generous introduction. My thanks to George Salem, Jim Zogby, all of the members of the Arab American Institute for this honor, uh, for which I'm deeply grateful. Uh, I speak quite often, so for me, the highlight of the evening is the introduction. <laughs> and I want to say, Ray, uh, I want you traveling with me uh, around the country to introduce me wherever I go. That was really wonderful. The danger, of course, from such generous introductions is that you might start to believe them. <laughs> so I like to begin by telling a story about introductions and how I was brought back down to earth. Uh, I spent five years in Northern Ireland. Uh, when I finished, I wrote a book about my experience, and uh, when it was published, I went on a tour of this country to promote sales. I received many, many invitations, and I learned in the process that in the United States, there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> Every one of them invited me. I couldn't accept them all, but I did many. And as I traveled around the country to these Irish societies, they developed an informal competition among them as to who could give the longest, most fantastic, often ridiculous introductions of me. The proper response, of course, would have been for me to show some humility, to urge them to keep it short, but I had an improper response. I kind of ate it up and I encouraged them, gave them more information, scolded them when they left something out. <laughs> One guy spent 35 minutes introducing me, <laughs> disclosing things about my life that I previously had not been aware of. <laughs> and when he finished, I get up and I told him that he'd left out the fact that when I graduated from high school in a small town in Maine, I got the science award my senior year. <laughs> So when I got to the last stop, which was the Irish American Society of Stamford, Connecticut, I was very much impressed with myself. My hat size had grown. I could just barely squeeze my head in through the front door. But when I did, the first person I encountered was an elderly woman who rushed up to me, very excited, shook my hand vigorously, almost knocked me over. And she said, I am thrilled to meet you. She said, I don't live anywhere near here. I drove three and a half hours just to come here and tell you what a great man you are for all the good things you've done around the country and to ask you, please, will you sign my poster? She had a poster with a photograph on it. She handed me the poster and pen, and I said, well, of course, I'll sign your poster. I looked at it, and I said, but before I do, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. She reacted badly. She said, you're not? Well, who are you anyway? When I told her, she said, well, that's terrible. She said, I drove three and a half hours to meet a great man named Henry Kissinger, and all I've got is a nobody like you. I said, well, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do to make you feel better. She said, there is. I said, well, what is it? And she leaned forward. I leaned forward, our foreheads were touching. She said in a conspiratorial voice, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> she said, would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name to my poster? So I did. Now here's the best part of the story. About a year ago, Kissinger and I appeared together at an event in New York. We had a big business crowd, and we had a moderator and the two of us, and he asked us questions about China and the Middle East and so forth. And I thought it would be a good time to tell that story, which I did. And the crowd loved it, and Kissinger really enjoyed it. 
So later, as we left, it was a high-rise building. He and I got in the elevator together. We went down. He said, you know, I've appeared with you often. I've heard you speak many times, especially when you were Senate Majority Leader. I have never heard you give a better talk than you did tonight. <laughs> I said, well, what was it? My answer on China or the Middle East? No, no, no. He said, it was that story you told. That's really great. He said, you should tell that all over America. So I have been. Now I can check off Washington, D.C. and the Arab American Institute. Well. I, I, I do want to say a few words uh, about my growing up and my parents. As with most human beings, my parents were the most influential persons in my life. Five years ago, I had the opportunity to serve as the U.S. Special Envoy to the Middle East, as Ray indicated in his introduction. And early in my tenure, I made it a point to visit all of the countries in the region to meet with the leaders there. In Beirut, I met with the President of Lebanon and with his cabinet and several of his advisors. He began the meeting by saying that he was, of course, aware that my mother had been born in Lebanon, and so he asked me to say a few words about her. I told him this story. When I was a young boy growing up in the small town of Waterville, Maine, my mother often said to me, to my sister, and to our brothers, you should see Lebanon. It's so beautiful. The mountains, the oceans, the forests, the air is pure, the water is clear. Oh, Lebanon, my Lebanon. Many years later, after my father died, my sister Barbara, who is here this evening, took my mother back to the village of her birth in Lebanon, the only time she ever returned. There they met with relatives and friends, and of course, being Lebanese, they had to have a big meal. Afterward, my mother was asked to say a few words, and she stood up and said to her relatives and friends, you should see America. <laughs> it's so beautiful. The mountains, the oceans, oh, America, my America. Well, I'm grateful to my sister Barbara for making that trip and preserving the story because it perfectly reflects my mother's attitude. And I'd like to ask my sister to stand, please, and be recognized. Yeah. That story reflects my mother because she saw the best in everyone and everything. She never let on that she had a very hard life because she found meaning and purpose in her faith and in her family. She was born Minta Hassad in a small village in the mountains of Lebanon. In 1920, when she was 18 years old, she came to America she had never before left Lebanon. She could not read, speak, or understand a word of English. She moved in with her sister and brother-in-law in Waterville, and there she soon learned the trade that she would work at for the rest of her life, a weaver in a textile mill. And for nearly five decades, her entire working life, she worked the night shift in a textile mill from 11 o'clock in the morning in the evening until 7 o'clock in the morning. She did it so her children would never have to. My father was born in Boston, the youngest son of Irish immigrants. He never knew his parents, and he was raised in an orphanage. He was later adopted by an elderly, childless couple John and Mary Mitchell. They had been born in Lebanon, emigrated first to Egypt, where they lived in Alexandria for 10 years, and then they came to the United States. So my father was raised in a Lebanese household, and he soon learned Arabic and spoke it fluently. But his childhood was very short. 
He left school after the fourth grade to begin a long life of hard work and low wages, ending up as a janitor at a local school. When she arrived in this country, my mother moved in with her sister and brother-in-law who lived on the same street as the Mitchells. And soon, my parents met, fell in love, and married. Despite the strenuous demands of working all night in a textile mill, my mother was always home in time to get us off to school, five children, and ready with supper when we got home. After putting us to bed in the evening, she left for work. She slept only briefly every day, but to us she seemed tireless, strong, energetic, full of life, full of love. She often must have been exhausted, and surely she must have complained in private, but never to us or in our presence. To us, she was always there, always strong, always ready, always supportive, always loving. My parents knew little of history or political science, but they understood the meaning of America. They conveyed their values to their children not by words, because neither was eloquent, but by example. Though it was not often expressed orally, their message was clear, their values simple and universal in reach. Faith, family, country, work. My mother's My mother's faith was total, central to her life, an integral part of everything she did. After she stopped working, she attended church every day. For her, religion meant more than just listening to the gospel or reciting it. It meant living its message in daily life, and she did. She integrated faith, love, and charity into a life of meaning, even though she lacked education, status, or wealth. My parents' commitment to their children was total and unwavering. Their goal was to see that all of their children graduated from college, and we all did. My mother was, by far, the most influential and impressive person in my life, more than anyone or anything else. She is responsible for who I am and what I've done. What I like best about telling this story is that I know that many, many of you, perhaps most here tonight, are much the same. Family history is much the same. Parents who sacrificed for you, and you have pride in our heritage and love of America. And I think that we all believe in the American dream because we've lived it. To me, there are many lessons from my mother's life. And one of them is that wherever we're from, we're fortunate to be Americans, citizens of what is, despite its many imperfections, still the most free, the most open, the most just society in all of human history. Before I entered the Senate, I had the privilege of serving as a federal judge. It was a position of great power, and I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> but what I most enjoyed was when I presided over what are called naturalization ceremonies. They're citizenship ceremonies. A group of people who'd come from all over the world and who'd gone through the required procedures gathered before me in a federal courtroom in Maine. There, I administered to them the oath of allegiance to the United States, and by the power vested in me under our Constitution and law, I made them Americans. It was always very emotional for me because of my parents' history, but it was because of my parents' efforts and because of the openness of American society that I, their son, was able to get an education and go on to become the majority leader of the United States Senate. 
After every ceremony, I made it a point to speak to each of the new Americans, individually and in family groups. I asked them why they came, how they came. Their answers were all inspiring. Many of us here are Americans by an accident of birth. Most of them are Americans by an act of free will, often at great risk to themselves and their families. Although the answers were as different as their countries of origin, through them, they were common, from them, there were common themes. And they were best summarized by a young Asian man who, when I asked why he came, he answered in slow and halting English, I came because in America, everybody has a chance. Think about the fact that a young man who had been an American for 10 minutes, who could barely speak English, was able to sum up the meaning of our country in a single sentence. America is freedom and opportunity, a society in which no one should be guaranteed success, but everyone should have a fair chance to succeed. Of course, we all know that opportunity for everyone remains an aspiration, not a reality. And our task as Americans, who have gotten all of the benefits we've received from this country, is to do all we can to make that aspiration a reality. And for me, that means trying each day in every way I can to make it possible for every child born in America to have the same chance in life that I had. I close by repeating what I said at the outset. I'm honored by this award. And the only thing I would change would be to add three words to that plaque that Ray handed me. Son of Mintaha. Thank you. Thank you. May God bless all of you, and may God bless the United States of America.